everyone. My name is Dana Brown. I'm Zojo's Director of Marketing. In this tutorial, we're going to continue working on our personal expenses example app. In previous videos, we saw how to add expenses entries, set their category, date, amount, and description values. But the main problem now is that all these entries will be lost once we exit the app. That is, we don't provide a way so that the user can save their expenses to disk so the app can retrieve them when it's run again. This is something that we're going to fix today and add data persistence to our example app. For that, we're going to create a file on disk whose contents will be the expenses data in text format so we can read them every time the app is run again. But let's start doing some minimal changes before we start dealing with files. The first one will be setting the app name under the build settings section on the navigator panel. As you can see, when we choose the deployment target, in this case, Mac OS, then we can type the name for the app under the Mac app name section in the inspector panel, and also the processor architecture we wanna compile the app for. Um, also the bundle identifier being uh, a unique bundle identifier for the app in reverse DNS format. Next, we're gonna instruct the app to close itself as soon as the user closes the last open window. With this app, uh, our app only uses one window, so it probably would be useful to exit the app when the user closes the window using the command W shortcut or clicking the close widget of the window. This is something we can do by adding the open event handler in the app object, writing the line of code next, that is, we'll set the allow auto quit property to true. Let's run the app to try this behavior and also to refresh how we added expenses that are lost once we exit the app. We start by choosing a category, typing the purchase date, the name for the purchased item, and then the amount value. Let's add a second expense entry using the same category. A third entry using a different category. And a fourth expense using another category for it. So we can see all of our entries in the list box displaying the grand total for them. But the problem is that we would need to retype everything the next time we run the app. So let's close the window now using the close widget. So we can see how the app will quit automatically because we set the allow auto quit property to true. Let's see now how we implemented the data persistence in the app. Something as easy as writing to a file on disk at the desired disk path. For that, we added two new event handlers under the window object, close and open. The code in the close event simply calls the save data method, while in the open event, we create a new dictionary for the categorized expenses property of the app object, which is the property that we use to store our expense instances. As you can see, this property is declared as a dictionary data type. Then returning to the open object, we call the load data method. So how do we save the data? We're going to use the folder item class for that. The folder item class from the Zojo framework has all method and properties to deal with storage devices and files. For example, through its properties, we can see how many files are in a directory, if it is readable or writable amongst others, and we will also be able to copy, move, or delete files and other actions. Folder item also provides shared methods, which are functions we can use without the need of creating an instance in the first place. For this tutorial, we're going to use child to create or access a file on disk, and also remove to delete the specified file. So the F variable declared as a folder item will point to the specified file. In order to provide the root and the name of the file, we use the special folder helper, which gives us access to some usual directories, as is the case of application data. Once we run or compile our app, application data will point to the right directory for the OS that our app is run on. If we look into the documentation for the special folder, we can see the names that we can use and the real paths they will point to on every supported OS. 
Returning to the code on the save data method, we use the child providing as the parameter the name for the app file itself. In order to get rid of the file extension, as it is the case in the Windows executable file or Mac OS bundles, we use the strings nth field method in order to get just the file name at the left of the dot character. Next, if we get a reference to that file and it exists, then we delete it or reuse it to write new data. In the next line of code, we're going to use another new class declaring the toss variable as a text output stream data type. The text output stream class will let us save data as text in a stream created for the specified file. In order to get such a reference, we only need to call the open method on the text output stream class itself, providing the f variable as the parameter. In the next line of code, we declare the keys variable as an array of variant data type. Don't bother about variant data type at this point, but we'll assign it to all of the keys used in the categorized expenses dictionary. We can retrieve these by calling the keys method on our categorized expenses property. Then we declare another helper variable, the entries array that we will store expense instances. Next, we iterate every key stored in the keys array using for that the for each next block. So in this case, the local key variable will contain the value of iterated item in the array. Then we will write that key value to our text stream. Next, we assign to the entries array the value stored in the categorized expenses dictionary for the current key value. And we use a second for each block to iterate, in this case, all of the expenses all the, the expense instances stored in the entries array. You can always review the chapter devoted to loops if you need to refresh how they work. Once we receive the iterated expense in the local expense item variable, we will want to write it to the stream as a line of text composed by the concept value of the expense, followed by the tab character, then the expense amount converted to string from double, followed by another tab character, and lastly, the value of the expenses date property converted to a string in SQL format, something achieved by calling the SQL date on the date property. Saving the date in SQL format will allow us to create a new date instance from it later. And then, as you can see here, it doesn't take too many lines of code saving our expenses data to a file in text format. In fact, when this method is executed, it will create a file on disk as the one we see here. You can see how the key is written in the first place, and then all of the expenses created under that category name with the format we set, expense name, amount, and date separated by the tab character, something it does for every iterated key in the dictionary. In addition, you can see how the file name takes the name of our application and it is saved in the path set by the special folder dot application date method, pointing to the application support folder under the library folder on macOS. Once we know how we can save our expenses data, let's see how we can retrieve them. So in the load data method, we start declaring an F, an F variable as a folder item pointing to the same path we expect to find the file and using the same name for the file itself. If the f variable points to a valid object and it exists, then that means that we will probably be okay for reading it. And if for writing text to a file, we use an instance of the text output stream class. In this case, we need to get an instance from the text input stream class. As you can see, in order to get that instance, we only need to call the open shared method on the class itself passing along the f folder item variable as the parameter. Next, we need to declare a series of variables that will be used during the reading of the file, and also in order to recreate new expense instances from the data read. In order to read every line of the text file, we're going to use the do loop until loop variant. That is, we'll execute all the code in the block until the condition set at the end is evaluated as true and the condition set in the loop is reaching the end of the file, something we can check calling the end of file method on the text input stream referenced by the tis variable. The code inside the loop assigns, in the first, assigns the line of text 
read from the file to the buff variable. Then we want to know if the line read is a key, that is a category, or a line containing expense data. This is something we check in the next line of code using the index of method on the string data stored in the variable. The index of method will return negative one if the string doesn't contain uh, the searched string, in this case, the tab character. If that is the case, that would mean that it is a category line. So we need to check next if we already created expense instances from another line read in the text. And because we will store these expense entries in the items array, we only need to read the last row index property from that array. If it equals negative one, that means the array is empty. Otherwise, if the items array is storing expenses already, then we will add them to the new temporary expenses array declared as local inside this if then block of code. In order to do that, we will iterate over all the rows in the items array and we'll store them in the temporary final items array. Observe that both array variables are declared as expense data types. Then we only need to assign the temporary array as the value for the categorized expenses dictionary using the current value of the T key variable as the value of the dictionary key. Next, we will remove all of the entries stored in the items array and finally assign the content of the buff variable to the T key variable as the current key read from file. If, however, index of returns a positive value, then that would mean that buff contains a line of text for an expense. In that case, it will execute the block of code after the else. In this block of code, the first thing we do is assign a class prop values declared as an array of strings. The string contents of the buff variable previously converted to an array using the two array method. As you can see in the documentation, that method receives a uh, as a parameter, the character or string we want to use as the separator to divide the original string as rows in the generated array. It will create an array of three rows assigning the class prop values array. In fact, we also know that the index zero, zero of that array will be the expense name, index one of the array will be the expense amount, and the index two will be the state stored in SQL format. So we only need to store in the partial value variable the row stored as the second item of the class prop values array and previously converted to a double using the from string method on the da double data type itself. Next, the total value variable is set to its own value plus the new value stored in partial value. Next, we create a new expense instance using its constructor method. So we need to provide the parameters in the expected order by the constructor. That is the name, the item name in the first place, the amount as the second parameter, and the purchase date as the third one. So we create the new instance providing in the first place the item name stored as the, row, the first row in the class prop values array, then the amount stored in the partial value variable as double, and then a new date time instance created from the string stored as the third row in the class prop values array. Once the expense date has been created, we add a new row to the window list box named items list box using again the item name and the format function we already know from the previous chapters in order to format the expense value. As you can see in the format documentation, you can use a series of characters as placeholders in order to set the format you want to give as a string to the numeric value. We're using three positions for the thousands, another three for the hundreds, followed by the decimal separator, and two places for the decimal values. Finally, we only need to add the new expense entry instance to the items array, a process that will be repeated until the end of the file is reached. Once all of the file has been processed, we only need to store the current items array in the categorized expenses dictionary using the current value in the T key variable as the dictionary key. Finally, we assign the total value to the label in charge of displaying that information in the window. Once we know how to save and read the expense data to and from the file, it's time to execute our example app again. And you can see how we don't need to retype the entries because they have been read from the file. 
recreated as expense instances, and displayed in the list, list box as we would expect. In fact, we can continue using our app, entering new expenses for every one of the available categories. As an example, let's add a new expense entry under the travel category. We quit the app, opening the generated file, and we can see how it contains all our expenses grouped by category and includes the one that we just added. If we run the app again, the file will be read and it will display the expected expenses, including that last one for travel. If you felt a little lost in this video, I recommend going back and look at some of the topics we've already done, like loops, conditionals, classes, and the use of the constructor. While data persistence can be made in multiple ways, we prefer to limit this approach to the things that we already know. To focus on new ones like folder item, text input stream, and text output stream classes. I hope you learned something in this video. Uh, please like it and post a comment if you've uh, tried this and subscribe to our channel so you get notifications when new videos for this course are posted as well as other topics.